week that we were just so excited about what God was doing around us as we got to watch so many lives won to Jesus. Amen? Does it, what was Amen? amen. All right, I was just say, you better check your pulse because that ain't going to work. We're excited about how many lives were won to Jesus. Amen? amen. All right. You, you know what it is? It, it really is crazy. It causes me to reflect. It's been a very reflective week. Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames of Drama, we love it. it. It's something that just paints a very vivid picture that you can see. You know, you get a window into the spiritual world that's going on around us that we're unaware of. It's happening all around us every day. Amen? And when you see a world that's running as fast as it's running, worrying about all the issues of life, trying to escape the issues of life with various whatever, and you see them come into a place where for a minute they consider something that's happening before their eyes. And at some point through all the drama, they see maybe in one or two of the scenes, they see their life. And they realize that one day you will take your last breath here. And it brings us to that place, you know. It brings us to a place that reflection occurs. I remember my early days as a believer. Boy, I remember the misconceptions about God. I thought somehow, I thought somehow that when you got saved, there was going to, I don't know, not, not that there'd be a red carpet rolled out in front of you, but at least the roads would be paved that you would travel. Anybody struggle with that same misconception? That you thought that when, when God saves you, that somehow, you know, you hear of this abundant life, you hear of, you know, plans that he has for us to prosper, not to harm, for a future, we hear about all those. Those are all true. But the problem is, God has to bring us to a place that we can understand what he's talking about. Amen? So we have a misconception. Why? Because we came out of the ugliness of this world and our values were based on the ugliness of the value system of this world. And God has to, to show us how that's all temporal. And he wants us to live eternal. And so he, he starts taking us on this journey. And I remember my earliest days of the journey. I was a little brat spiritually. I was a baby I mean, you know, I was a baby. I, I was whimpering and crying about everything to God, you know. I thought that, you know, when, if two or more are gathered and when he's with you, when you would pray to him and ask for anything in his name, he'd give it to you. I didn't realize that was for his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, not my kingdom. Amen. I didn't realize any of that, but I quickly got brought into this process that he does to all of those, his children he loves, who God loves, he disciplines. And I was a brat, I'll just tell you, at times. At times I ran right along and I was being, you know, just nurtured on the word and I was so excited. And that's what kept me moving along and willing to be corrected by my Father in heaven is because I knew the word was true when it rang in my ear and the Holy Spirit of God said with my spirit said amen and I knew that's truth and many times I didn't like the truth that I said amen to amen when it means that something radically is going to have to change in your life because it doesn't fit into that perimeter amen and so we go on this journey and I remember the early days and I remember wondering a lot about the word of God right and I remember how lost I was and then God saved me. And he saved me for a purpose. And he saved you for, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he saved you for a reason as well. And if you don't know him as Lord and Savior, he wants to save you here tonight. He wants you to meet that redemptive love that he provided through the blood of his son. The refiner's fire, you see it on your screen. And that's something I found very, very quickly on my journey because there was so much in my life that was so wrong 
the way, the natural man's mind, the way that I was living. Everything that I based my decisions on was coming from a worldly perspective. I had to change that, right? Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Well, I didn't have any renewing. I was lost, and I was then rescued, and then God had to begin a work. In the renewing your mind process alone, when you have this mind renewal, you have an option. Either Jesus can be Lord through those times of renewing of the mind, or you can just simply say, go fish. I'm not interested. How many have done that? How many have heard, you know, you're in the word, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world. That's your friends and all their opinions. That's Oprah, and it's anybody else who wants to horn in on a plan for your life. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is as good as pleasing his perfect will. Well, when the word is confronting us and we look at it and we're like, it's a buffet, I'll pick this. I don't want any of that. I'll take a little of this. Because my life's a train wreck and these things work, right? It's amazing how many people right now are faced with the vaccine that's been mandated in many cases that they want to know if there's a religious exemption. You hear what I'm saying? What, can that God of yours do anything about this mess I don't want to be involved in? What about he wants to transform your life? I remember those days. I remember them and they're legitimate. And the journey is legitimate. And that's why our God who knows, he knows all our sins, he knows the cleansing he wants to do in our life, he were precious to him. We are precious to the Lord. And those who surrender to him, he'll purify us through the sanctification process. Amen? It's the craziest thing. The hardest things you're confronted with, he'll deal with them in your life. If you'll just bow a knee to him and call him Lord. In other words, he, he's not giving you suggestions. He's telling you realities. And when we allow our life to line up with those realities, we have a changed person. Amen? Amen? But if we, if we have somebody that hears them and doesn't do them, James said that's a man that looks at his face in the mirror and forgets what he looked like. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all their ways. We don't want to be unstable in all our ways, do we? So I want to take you on a little journey. Based on just thinking about this Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames and how many people, I talked to a lot of people, sent text messages to everybody that was up front here, every single person that filled out a card I sent the text message to. And I got a lot of messages back and I was interacting with people and it was interesting. Interesting because it took me back to a place that I remember when this was all foreign to me and I didn't know anything. I just knew that there was a God in heaven that loved me enough to send his son. And I knew when I asked for that redemptive blood to count for me, I knew that the weight of my sin left my, my shoulders and I was forgiven. And then from there it was a journey, but man, as that journey was interesting. But God's word has a way of painting a picture, and I'm hoping that tonight, that as we go on a journey together, that we'll get it. That this will be able to have this effect on our lives where you'll get it. So here we go. We're going to start out, well, let me just give you Psalm 12, verse 6, as this. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. You know, as I was getting ready to uh, do this service tonight, I was thinking a lot about the refiner's fire and what God does. And I was thinking about metals, precious metals, and watched a couple little videos on the refining of precious metals. And a crucible is a is a vessel that can endure great heat above the precious metals. It will withstand incredible heat. And they put them in there, and it's a, they take this, 
like fine sand and they put it in there and they bring it to a boil and when it goes to a boil, the impurities then stick to the sand. They pour it into a cone-like uh, vessel. It goes in there and the impurities and that sand ball goes to the top and it pulls right off the top once it's cooled. And it's an interesting thing that that purity in the, in the picture that is there Interesting, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. We're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be looking at Malachi. It's a little bit of history. Malachi was a prophet who lived about 400 years before Jesus walked this earth, all right? And this prophet was speaking to Israel on behalf of God. Malachi's words were to the Israelites. It was about the covenant that broke with God, and he was reminding them of God's deep love for them, all right? And he, he was telling them, in my, in my lingo, to act like they've got some sense, they need to get right with God again. Amen? That's a, that's a street version right there. So I'm going to take you to Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. It says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we, how have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord. And he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? Wow. Well, that's enough to make anybody angry. God looking at them and the only thing that they can see is, you know, you're pleased with those who do evil. And where is the God of justice? Isaiah 48, verse 9 through 11 says this. For my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you, so as not to destroy you completely. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. Psalm 66.10 and following says, For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through the fire and water, but you brought us to the place of abundance. And Matthew 5, 44 and following says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Well, one of the ways that God takes us in this refiner's fire that we struggle with is his great love and mercy that he, he wants so desperately for all of mankind to come to this saving grace, this journey. And he uses his children to bring you there. He paints a picture to all humanity of his love and redemptive power because he doesn't just drop the hammer on us. And it's a hard thing to realize that it's as I'm going down the roads of life, the things that are going on in my life, that there's a purpose that goes beyond what I understand. And that God wants to do something with my life. And if my focus is all on me, I miss it all. I miss it all because it all becomes about me, what's going on in my world, and I usually I'm a victim. But when I understand that God has a bigger picture and I'm part of a bigger picture, in this redemptive process, he wants to do something. And every day as I go along the journey, he's refining me and he's refining others that are around me. And my heart needs to understand the heart of God. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Those provisions are abounding across this globe. Amen? And his church is supposed to be able to shine in the midst of it. 
He doesn't drop the hammer on us. Praise God He doesn't do that. Amen? Otherwise, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? Well, I want to look where the prophet speaks about the refiner's fire, Malachi chapter 3. We read what ticked off God when they, they just had this attitude that God was uh, doing them wrong and allowing wickedness to go on. And they weren't happy. Chapter 3, it picks up. Verse 2 and 3 says, But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launder's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offering in righteousness. Wow. Well, you can hear something going on there. Who can stand? Malachi was making a comparison of the refiner's fire <coughs> and God transforming the Levites. <coughs> Excuse me. As he refines and purifies them like gold and silver. How many here would say they felt like they might have been in the refiner's fire at a time or two? Amen? Things were going on and you didn't understand. But the heat kept on rising. Amen? I'm not talking about a physical heat. I'm not talking about your air conditioner not working. I'm talking about the circumstances of life where God is trying to bring you to the end of yourself and bring you to a place that you understand He wants to do something in your life that He becomes your all in all. Amen? Not just in word, in reality. Malachi is speaking to God's chosen people, Israel. Malachi talked about God's love for Israel and that they had broken their covenant with God again and again. God was active in their lives. They're his beloved children. His deep love for them, and he became upset with their wickedness. How many of you would say that you've been hurt by something one of your children would say to you when they perceive you as wicked? It cuts deep, doesn't it? How about this? If you're not, you don't have children, how many would say a, that a loved one perceives you as wicked? Your intent was wicked. It hurts bad, doesn't it? Well, God loves us so much, it hurts him when we perceive him that way. And, you know what, I, the, the thought that I was having as I was preparing, <clears throat> I was thinking about my early days. And I was thinking about how many times I misunderstood a circumstance that was unfolding and I was making indictments about God in my head and in my heart. That he was not a good God. And that the things of scripture that I, that I was reading, I didn't understand that these things were happening and they have a purpose that I don't comprehend. And that all of these scriptures that I now know and I can quote, those were tools in this sanctification process that changed my perspective of God, right? When you hear, lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Amen? What does that say about leaning on your own understanding? Don't do it. In all your ways acknowledge him. Amen? And he'll make your path straight. And we've talked about that. Our straight path might be right through the middle of a mountain. It's an unrefined road that he wants us to make the road walkable for others as we travel with the Lord through it. He wants us to walk to the base of a mountain, and, <laughs> excuse me, and by faith command it to uproot itself and cast itself into the sea. And when I talk about a mountain, I'm not talking about going on a vacation to the base of a mountain standing there and having a fit because it won't uproot itself because that's not what the scripture is talking about. A mountain, a mountain to be moved, you're sitting in right now. This was a farmer's field. And a little church took on a calling to put a church here in an academy that everybody 
including the banks, said couldn't happen, but yet you're sitting in it tonight, aren't you? <laughs> Amen? So a mountain had to be moved, and at some point, somebody had to say that we're going to ask God to do what we cannot do for ourselves. And you know what? That mountain-moving experience took over a decade. And it didn't mean that God doesn't move good or big or any of those things. It means that he was doing a redemptive process, a sanctification process in our life that we could begin to stand in faith and go the distance when things required us to do so, right? And here we go on this process. We don't like it. Zechariah 13, 9 says, this, th this third I will put into the fire and I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. Isaiah 48, 10 says this, See, I have refined you, though as silver I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Proverbs 17, 3 says, The crucible of silver in the furnace of for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Psalm 66, 10 and following says, For you, God, tested us. You, ref you refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs and let people ride over our heads. We went through the waters, but you brought us to the place of abundance. 1 Peter 1, 7, These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which, which precious, even though refined by the fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And then we have some scriptures that, I, they're my soapbox in Next Step Ministry. But when you think in terms of of our character, what goes on. There's something that happens to us. As we go on this journey, you move on the journey and as you're going along, you feel like you've, you've made it somewhere and, you're, and you start to get it and you say, okay, well, there's a refining process and God is, he's taking some of these things that once were near and dear in my heart and now they're repulsive to me. Now I see that they're damaging to the cause of Christ and so therefore, you know, I'm going to press forward and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to attack the gates of hell with a water pistol. And then I come amongst the body of Christ and, and I find out that there's people that will sit amongst you and call themselves Christians that have no idea what it means to be seen by a lost world and have them drawn to the one who redeemed us because we are set apart for his use. So they live just like the world. And, excuse me. And so as we're pressing forward and we're trying to make progress for the Lord, you got people sabotaging what you're doing right in your path. And they're part of the church. Makes you angry. Amen? You know, gosh, Lord Jesus, have your way in this service. Listen to me, church. Do you understand that we're all part of the refiner's fire? You don't go in there by yourself. We go in there as the church of Jesus Christ. And in the process, God calls each one of us to be part of the refining process in each one of us. So when I'm standing beside somebody else that doesn't have vision, that sees through faith yet, they're just going through the motions because they know the Lord saved them and they're just not feeling in their heart to be part of what's going on. They are not motivated to action by our condemning words. They're motivated to action by the joy that happens in a heart that's been transformed. Amen? But listen, it's real when you're in this battle. It's real when the devil comes calling and he says, you got it going on. Things are going good. You got it going on. But you notice these people around you? They don't act like they got a lick of sense. You're trying to do all these things. You can't even get nobody to help you. 
You're trying to do these things, and instead of helping, they're a hindrance. And this anger builds inside, and it's very unbecoming to accomplish the purpose of God. Amen? But it's real. And it's something we've got to call out to the Lord and say, God, I want to have the heart of Jesus, right? I want to have the heart of Jesus. Here's this verse that I, it's my soapbox and you guys know it. You're going to know it when you hear it, but we're going to try to digest it a little bit, okay? James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, listen. Consider pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you go through trials of many kind, because you know that testing of your faith develops perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you go through trials of many kinds. Because the refiner's fire, the testing of your faith, develops perseverance, right? The refiner's fire. You know, that's the place where the crucible holds us and there's added to us something that would extract the impurities, right? Brought to unbearable temperatures until when the temperature cools, we look more like Jesus. He says, consider that pure joy. Consider that pure joy because the trying of your faith develops perseverance. Let perseverance complete its work. Let it. So what do you think that looks like? Let it complete its work. Man, there's so many scriptures that are applicable right here. Let it complete its work. Let it. I'm in the pressure cooker. Let it. Let it complete its work. Let it refine you. Let it refine the other person. Let the love of Jesus be seen through your life, through the crucible, in order that you both are growing in whatever God wants to do on this spiritual journey together. Listen, there's only one way you're going through. Listen, there's only one way you're going through that. Is we're going to have to adhere to the scripture and you tell the Lord, listen, God, as I'm right here before you and you're looking into the core of my heart, I don't want to do what you're asking me to do. I'm having a hard time I'm having a hard time with those around me. I'm strong. I know all the scriptures, Lord. Don't worry about the splinter in your brother's eye. Get the plank out of your eye. I know all of them. And I'm not talking about a plank in my <coughs> excuse me, in my eye. I'm talking about I'm talking about I've been there. I've got this stupid plank out of my eye. I can see vividly clear. And I'm looking at the speck in my brother's eye, and he refuses that it's there. Are you with me now? That's a real problem in the church, is it not? But how do we get through it? Well, here's a revelation for you, folks. Consider it pure joy. Hello. Praise God he doesn't drop the hammer on all of us. Amen? Amen. That his grace and mercy endures forever. Amen? Amen? And that in the midst of this craziness, say, Lord, I'm having a struggle with it. I'm having a struggle. I want to endure. I want to move on. I want to, I want to so grow and look like Jesus. And this problem has been put before me. He says, are you sure? You, have, you looked, have you looked at your life? Because my Bible says we're filthy rags before a holy God. So somewhere we miss the mark too, don't we? Amen? Let perseverance complete its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Amen? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and following says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Wow. 
Remember the first time that a preacher read me that verse? This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I about was going to kick him off his chair. All right, playing. Because he said it very, you know, pray continually, you know. Oh, he said, no, rejoice always, pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Yeah. Nodding ahead the whole nine yards. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You've got to be hosing me. What are you telling me? Well, listen, I wish somebody with a little more throttle might have told me that. Might have said, listen, you need to understand this real clear. We need to rejoice. You know, James said, consider pure joy. You need to rejoice. You need to find somewhere in you that you understand what's going on truly is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And if you can get your mind wrapped around, okay, this is God's will for me. I'm in the refiner's fire. He's burning out the things in my life that are the ugliness that put me in the place that I don't belong. And in this process, in this process, I have to look at this. This is God's will for me in Christ Jesus. He's Lord, I'm not. And so i got to start from that place, don't I? I have to start from a place to say, this is God's will for me in Christ Jesus. I'm going to give thanks in those things. God, I don't understand them one bit, but I'm going to thank you for them. I'm going to ask that you do something in my heart that I don't respond in rebellion which means I'm going to pray continually, right? And if I'm praying continually and I know that that's God's will for me in Christ Jesus, I might just have a little bit of rejoicing that goes on. Amen? When we're going through affliction and suffering, got to remember, God's in those circumstances, isn't he? He's in them. He's in them. He never leaves us or forsakes us. You can bank on that. Whatever you go through, it will not be in vain. Amen? You can make it a derailment. You can make it something that's just so out of whack. He strengthens our faith as he purifies our hearts. Amen? Crazy, crazy sanctification process that goes on. He starts making us look more and more like Jesus. And as we look more and more like Jesus, our attitudes change. The struggle of our heart diminishes. We start to look at people with compassion. When I think about the religious people of the day when Jesus walked this planet Earth here, man, he was praying for them from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, right? They were religious folks. They just had it all wrong. We need his redemptive work in the refiner's fire, don't we? Amen? I didn't hear any amens. Aren't we done with this yet? Think about this. Can you imagine having a commitment for God? You said that I'm just not wavering. How about our buddies Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into a blazing furnace, right? What do you think about that? That's a refiner's fire, don't you think? Amen? Remember their words? Our God can can save us from this, but even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down to your gods. Remember? Powerful. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25 says, Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. They're not hurt. In In the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You know what the crazy part about this refiner's fire stuff is? That he's in there with us. How about that? Did you ever consider that? He's in there with us. Every journey that we walk on. Every time that he calls us to let go of something that we've been holding on to. He says, I want you to let go of it because I'm supposed to be in that place. Right? Isaiah chapter 43, 2. B, it says... When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. 
craziest thing of the refiner's fire. He, he takes us to a place that looks crazy. It looks nuts. He takes us to the end of ourselves. The things that we say, we usually have a handful of things that we say, God, I'm going to give you anything but A, B, C, and D. Some of us just have an A and B, right? Usually a C and D and maybe an E and an F too. And we've got those so far hidden, nobody even talks about them because they're just kind of things nobody knows about and just us and the Lord does. <coughs> Excuse me. But surely he doesn't want those things, right? And he says, yeah, I, I want every bit of those. I want them because you've got to empty yourself all the way out in order that I can build you up. And the problem that we're having is I got this refining process. And as you're in the refiner's fire, some things are coming to the surface. Hmm. Some things are coming to the surface, but I'm not interested in you pulling off the impurities from the top. And then that precious, precious image of Jesus that would be seen in our lives isn't going to be seen very well, is it? God allowed Daniel to be thrown in a lion's den. He allowed Joseph to be sold into slavery by his brothers. Amen? <coughs> Excuse me. How much do you think that he might let you go through some hardships on your journey. Some of you need to understand something. If you've ever called upon the name of the Lord, let me come down here. If you've ever called upon the name of the Lord and he's redeemed you, in other words, you recognize you were a sinner, you've asked for his redemptive blood to be the penalty of your sin payment. When that happens, he is going to refine you. He's going to. The work that he began in you, the Bible says he's faithful to bring it to completion, right? You know how he does that? There's no magic. He refines it out of us. He refines it because the things of this world are the things that we grab onto. He says, that stuff's got to go. It's got to go. So I'm going to bring you to a place that you have the ability to say yes in that refiner's fire. You know what he doesn't do, though? He doesn't make puppets. God doesn't make puppets. People say, I don't like, I get so bitter because all this evil that's in this world, why would God allow that? Because he doesn't make puppets. That's why. You can't have it both ways. You can't have a free will and think that God should just drop the hammer on everything. He Let's it rain on the just and the unjust. Right? In other words, they move along on their journey and they think they're getting ahead and they're not getting ahead. They're not getting ahead. Sometimes God allows, well, we're watching from a distance. You see them, well, all I just watch them and the wicked, they've got new cars and they've got all these things going on in their lives. And here I struggle. I'm driving a beater and... Uh, I can't get out of my own way financially and all these different things. And the scripture says, what profit a man that gained the whole world yet forfeit his very soul. But what about, then you watch these people as the years pass and they find themselves devastated through relational breakdowns and all these things. And I've talked to many, many that find themselves in a in a shelter or a program, and I say, what happened in your life? And they'll say, well, I thought I had it all. Boy, I'm going to tell you, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that, I thought I had it all. And their house of cards came crumbling down. And where somebody was watching from a distance, and they said, the wicked is moving along, they're getting ahead, watch them, I'm in this really bad spots and look at them then you wind the clock ahead and I'm sitting beside them at the shelter and their world is crushed that's the fortunate ones because the fortunate ones in them shoes have an opportunity to meet Jesus let me tell you the story for the other ones 
The other ones travel down that road and they pursue those things of life and they have what they perceive as they've got it all. And they get killed in a car crash on the way home. And they find out that there was a Savior and his name is Jesus. And they never met him. And everything they live for is lost. And they meet a destiny that's a place called hell. Are you guys with me? This is an eternal journey that we're on, folks. The refiner's fire is God's love for us being expressed so that we can be purified, taking the worldly things out of us in order that we would be seen like his son. So that in the midst of a crazy, the hardships, when you understand he'll never leave us or forsake us and that he's guiding our path, in the path that he has you on, the road that he's got mapped for you, might be through the worst territory you've ever seen. The ugliest looking terrain you have ever seen. You look at God, this isn't even passable. He says, oh, it's passable. You got some trees to cut down. You got some things to move out of the way. Because here is your journey. So you're going to have to know in that moment, you're going to have to know that he is a good God and he's always good. He is Lord of all. And if I put the value in him and understand he is the one that guides my step, and that his word says this, we walk by faith and not by sight. And so when I'm being navigated on a journey by a God that takes me down roads that are not the ones that I pick, and I understand I'm leaning not on my own understanding. On all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge him. I'm going to be traveling in places I would never go. And I find myself on journeys. I find myself meeting people. I find myself having my heart molded so that it's broken when I look at somebody that at one time I would have cursed. Then I realize that the refiner's fire is doing its work. Amen? And the purpose of God becomes very apparent. And so when you think <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That was nice. Do we have your attention now? <laughs> Praise God. Well, I'm going to wind it down. God wants to accomplish things in your life and if you're here tonight, maybe you just asked the Lord to save you. Maybe you've been on this journey a while. And in the process of that, you've hit some hard times and you're like, where is God in this? Let me tell you where he is right beside you. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The difference in succeeding and failing is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they got thrown into that furnace. And they knew if we die in this moment, we go see him. And if he chooses that we walk this earth again, he'll join us. Amen? Amen? And so when you put your mind wrapped around the refiner's fire, and I'm in the most hellish of circumstances, you can count on this. He's standing beside you. And so as you're on the journey and you're brand new in your faith, you say, I don't have to understand any of it. It's the beauty of it. I don't have to understand any of it. Why? Because he says, lean not on my own understanding in all my ways acknowledge him. And he will make my path straight. Amen? So where are you tonight? Where do you find yourself? Are you at a place where you're like, well, I, don't, I didn't sign up for this refiner's fire. When I worked for the city and we had these, the attacks um, on 9-11, we became first responders in a different way. We got told that we might have to come and use heavy equipment and actually take up I-55 or a different roadways or something. If we had a terrorist attack, we would make those roads immovable. And I remember one of the guys that I worked with, he said this. He said, I didn't sign up for this. In other words, I'm, I'm a, I signed up, I'm changing street light bulbs. Or I'm doing whatever, right? I didn't sign up for this. Maybe you're saying the refiner's fire. I didn't sign up for this. Let me just tell you something. That the, maybe, maybe that's the attitude. Maybe, maybe somebody told you that about God's love and that Jesus would save you. And maybe you never 
we're told that there's a life here in the here and now that he wants to do something amazing with, right? And the only way that he can do that is we got to get out of his way and they got to see Christ in us. And for that to happen, you must enter the refiner's fire. Because there's some things in our life that cannot be seen by a world because they're just looking for something real. They don't need a bunch of hypocrites. It doesn't mean that we're holier than thou or anything. No, it means that the God of all creation loves us so much that he said that the work that he began in us, he will bring it to completion. Will you let him? Will you let him? He said, well, God's all powerful. What do you mean let him? Consider pure joy when you go through trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Let perseverance. Do you hear me? Let perseverance complete its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let the Lord work in your life. Don't squabble every time that it feels like the heat's getting turned up. Don't squabble when the understanding of what's going on is beyond your vision. He says, why are you trying to understand something I told you not to try to do? Because I'm going to accomplish things that's so multidimensional in the lives of people. There's no way you can comprehend it, but you can do this. You can walk by faith, and then as a decade passes and you look back, you'll see the evidence of a redemptive process in your life. You'll see lives that were largely impacted and you didn't know what was happening. But when you look back, wow, if I would have did this, this would have never happened. Amen. And that's it. The refiner's fire, man. I'm going to tell you, I've been in it a lot. And I was in it last week. I looked like a little crying kid kicking my feet. I'm not playing. I'm not proud of it either. That's why I'm here tonight talking to you right now on this right now because heaven's gates and hell's flames were here and the devil came calling and he wanted to take the soldiers down that were part of what was going on and we find ourselves in a heat of a fire like you've never seen and God said there's some ugly things in you that have to go and I said no there ain't nothing I didn't want to hear it you know why because I was in the middle of the service of God's work so what needs to go out of me? And, you know, I love what Pastor Randy says. Sometimes he's so insightful, he says some cool things. <laughs> he says, the devil always overplays his hands. He always overplays his hands. Because he was trying to derail what was going on in here. And you know what happened? Some refining happened. Because when I was faced with the ugliness of what was going on here, I had to give it to God. Once I gave it to God, the devil didn't have that hold on me anymore. And another refining process was complete. Are you with me? Where are you tonight? Is God wanting to do some refining? Is he already done some while you've been sitting here? I mean, because here it is. If it's come to the top, we need to scrape it off and it needs to be God of your life and it's gone. You're going to let it settle back in. Go out the door with it and keep it for another season. Make no mistake. He that began that good work in you, he is faithful to bring it to completion. He's going to turn the heat up again. He's going to go for round two or three or four or five. But he's going to get it done. Why don't we get on the same page together? We'll get on the same page together in order that, guess what? He'll accomplish his purpose in and through our lives, in the lives who he's entrusted to us. We always give an invitation here in this church service. And I do that because I believe that if you've heard something that you need to do business with God, you need to walk up front in front of everybody. Say, God, I heard you. I know this refining process. I don't wear that well. I start cussing or I start kicking my heels or I'm saying, I'm not doing it or Johnny ain't going to happen, right? We say those things and God wants to do some refining. He says, listen, I want you just to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
And watch what he does. When your image to a lost world looks like Jesus, when what comes out of your mouth is not what somebody's accustomed to hearing, and as a result of that, they say, I don't know what's happened in your life, but I see it. Then you understand that refiner had a purpose, amen? Wherever you find yourself tonight, if there's something God wants to deal with with you, come on up and tell him, I heard you got him, I'm going to do it. If you've never asked Jesus to rescue you from your sin, in other words, you, you're walking this planet and there's never been a time that you said, God, I agree with you, I'm a sinner. And I need what Jesus did on that cross to count for me. If you've never done that, let tonight be the night of your salvation. Wherever you find yourself, as the music plays, would you come? Counselors, if you would come forward.
Father God, I thank you for this time together. God, as we struggle on our journeys, we struggle as we try to press forward in a hostile world that we live in today. We try to find that peace that surpasses all understanding. God, we're looking for an experience that allows us to just be comfortable in our faith, that we could come in amongst the brethren and, and God, that we would relax together. Instead, we live in a day God, that we as soldiers of Christ need to be seen in this world. Somebody desperately needs to see the authenticity of your awesome power lived through lives that say, yes, Lord. God, as you turn the heat up on your children, God, will we shine as we are refined. The world see the peace that surpasses all understanding lived in hearts that know that in the process of what you're doing in and through our lives, you're walking with us in order that we can introduce Jesus to those who don't know you. God, let us be attractive to this world, even in the midst that they hate us, as you said, they hated you and they'll hate us also. But to those you draw to yourself, God, you quicken to their eye something that says that's real. God, we know that you've called us to be a light in the midst of darkness now. God, we want to shine like stars in a dark and deprived generation. Let it be so in the midst of the refiner's fire. Let your children give you glory and honor as it is due. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.